Hey class, and welcome back for the second half here of chapter three, where we're going to talk about projectile motion. So when I say projectile motion, what we're talking about is an object that's moving through space only under the influence of gravity. And so for now, when you hear projectile motion or when you see things moving through space only under the influence of gravity, we're going to ignore air resistance. Now, that's not really what's happening, right? Even if I throw this tennis ball at a relatively low speed, right, it's still going to be moving and running into or slamming into the air, and that air offers resistance as the ball hits it, and that's where the term air resistance comes from. So while air resistance does offer a negative acceleration to the ball, slowing it down somewhat, we're going to ignore that because really it's actually a rather complicated force that we'll talk about a little bit later. It changes based on how fast an object's going, which makes sense, right? When you're driving faster in your car, there's more resistance from the air than when you're only driving like five miles an hour or something, right? And so because of that, the equations that we've been dealing with turn into quadra or excuse me, turn into differential equations, which is a bit above the current math level for this class. So all that, long story short, we're going to ignore air resistance for that reason at this point in the course. So talking about projectile motion, a really neat thing is true when dealing with an object and when you have very little or are able to ignore air resistance. What happens is if you have two objects and one's moving horizontally initially and the others just drop from rest, all right, what happens is, maybe I'll go big screen for this, okay? What happens is if this one's thrown sideways with an initial x velocity but zero initial y velocity, what happens is as they fall as a result of gravity, they end up falling at the exact same rate. And in fact, Mythbusters did a whole episode on this. And while it wasn't perfect because of all kinds of complications, they tried to shoot a bullet and drop a bullet at the same instant and see whether or not they fell at approximately the same rate. And they were very close to doing so. There's some weird aerodynamics that sometimes can alter things. But in general, if you throw something perfectly horizontally and drop something at the same instant, the two will hit the ground at the exact same time. Okay, that's, you know, you can't really see that very well, but that's what's happening. Okay, and so what we can conclude from that is that if an object is dropped, its acceleration is just going to be the acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.8 meters per second squared straight down. And if it's fired horizontally, its acceleration in the x direction will be zero. And so again, all the time, what you're going to see for projectile motion, acceleration in the x direction, zero meters per second squared, and in the y, 9.8 meters per second squared down. Quick note here, notice I put negative g. g always just represents the value of gravity, the 9.8 meters per second squared. So that negative means 9.8 meters per second squared down. So here's just showing you in really big, bold letters and numbers, acceleration in the y direction, the vertical direction under projectile motion, always 9.8 meters per second squared down, or 9.81 if you round to three sig figs, and the acceleration in the x direction is zero meters per second squared, meaning that your x velocity will be constant. It will not be changing since you have no acceleration. Okay, so let's do an example. Here's a fun little example. I don't know if any of you have ever gone paintballing, but imagine you have a paintball gun. You have apparently a pretty nice one that can generate an initial velocity of 75 meters per second. So the ball comes out of the nozzle of the paintball gun at 75 meters per second. Let's imagine now you're going to shoot it perfectly horizontally, okay? So you're lined up where the nozzle of the gun's parallel to the ground, but based on your height, you're holding it one and a half meters above the ground. Given just those two pieces of information, I want you to tell me, first of all, how long is the paintball in the air? So time, how many seconds? And second, where does it land? How far away from you will it land? So we're going to assume you're shooting at me and, you know, I use my physics prowess to dodge your paintball so you don't hit me and instead it goes flying off and just lands on the ground. Okay? You might want to shoot me with paintballs by the end of the semester. Anyway. Anyway. So pause it. Give it a go. Ready? Go. Follow the process. Trust the process. Do the process. Did you pause it? Okay. So hopefully you give it a go. First thing you want a picture. So here's a little sketch. I went ahead and put it right over our image. And in here you can see some of the variables listed. I'm calling my initial y height 1.5 meters because that's how high above the ground it starts. 
I'm gonna call my final Y location down here where it hits zero. I'm gonna call my initial X zero, and my final X, I don't know, that's what I'm trying to find. My initial velocity in the X direction is 75 meters per second. What's my initial velocity in the Y direction? Zero, because it's being shot perfectly horizontally, so it's not moving up or down when it starts. So if you notice, I gave you two numbers, but hidden in there is your final Y height is zero, initial X position is zero, initial X, excuse me, initial Y velocity is zero, acceleration in the X is zero because it's projectile motion, and acceleration in the Y is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So I gave you two numbers, but there's five hidden variables that you had to extract from the problem without them being given to you. Make sure you make note of that and get in the habit of doing that. So here's my Y variables as we mentioned. All right, if we wanna go ahead and solve, we can use this to try to solve for the time, which is what we're asked to figure out, right? So I went ahead and said, hey, look, this equation here, it doesn't have V final in the Y because we don't know what that is. A lot of people wanna say V final is zero, it hits the ground, right? Well, that's after there's been an outside influence from the ground, an outside force. So really what we're talking about is the velocity, the instant, just the one instant right before it impacts the ground. That's the final speed, okay? So it is not zero, we don't know what it is, and so I chose the equation of motion that does not depend on the final velocity so that I can solve for time. So we go ahead and plug in our variables. Our final position is zero, our initial velocity is zero, so our equation reduces quite simply to negative y initial equals one half a t squared. You're gonna solve for t and some of you might be concerned, wait, square root of a negative? No, acceleration is also negative, so the negative signs will cancel. So your negatives cancel in here, as you can see, and you find that it will take, boom, a box worthy 0.553 seconds to reach the ground. All right, now for the second part of the problem, you're asked to figure out the final distance. So now we go to our x equation. Notice that initial and final velocities are equal and acceleration is zero. So some of your equations of motion based on those two facts aren't gonna be really helpful. But the same one we already used is actually the one you're gonna want to uh, use in this calculation, which again is our second equation of motion seen here. Notice if acceleration equals zero, right? All of this goes away and what you're left with is position equals initial position. So your displacement equals velocity times time. Distance equals rate times time. That's an equation you probably learned years ago, which assumes zero acceleration. So what we find here, boom, boxworthy 41.5 meters, it lands away from you as you shot at and missed the target. All right, here's a fun conceptual question for you all, okay? Let's imagine you have that same paintball gun, all right? You're driving in a car, okay? You're gonna drive in, you know, a convertible, an open air car or whatever. You're gonna take your paintball gun and you're gonna shoot it straight up in the air while your car is on cruise control. So let's say it's going at like 25 miles an hour on cruise control, so it's staying at a constant velocity and you shoot that gun straight up in the air. Where does the bullet land and why? In front of you, behind you, or does it hit back in the barrel of the gun? What do you think and why? All right, hopefully you answered, okay? What do you think? Well, the correct answer, believe it or not, is it will land directly back in the barrel of the gun. Now, a lot of people think this is sort of weird, right? But that's exactly what we see all the time, right? If I'm like moving forward, it's kind of hard to do since I don't have a lot of space, but if I walk forward, if I'm moving forward at a constant speed and toss this ball straight up and down, okay, for me, it moves up and comes back down. From your perspective, it looks like it's moving in an arc, okay? But if I'm moving at a constant speed and just toss it straight up and straight back down, it's just gonna go up and come right back into my hand following in an arced pattern because it's moving with the initial velocity that I have in the X direction is the same as the ball because as the car is moving or as I am moving, the ball's moving with me and so throwing it straight up, it still has that horizontal velocity, right? And now this might seem a little weird to people but you, you should be used to this, right? Have you ever been on an airplane, for example? This is a place that I always love thinking about physics because there's so much involved, right? But imagine you're in an airplane, right? If you're in an airplane and you take a tennis ball, you're moving at like hundreds of meters per second, right? If you were to drop the tennis ball, what happens? It falls straight down, right? It continues to move forward with you at hundreds of meters per second. 
How weird would it be if you took the tennis ball, you're in the airplane, you're like, oh, I'm going to just drop it. Whoop, boom. It just disappears, going flying off to the side. That would be crazy, right? It doesn't get left behind. It's moving with you because it has what we're going to define later in the semester known as inertia. It continues to move with that initial velocity it has unless there's something to slow it down. If we're ignoring air resistance like in this example or in the airplane where the air is also moving so there is no air resistance, the object continues to move forward at its same speed until it experiences some outside acceleration. So kind of fun, interesting example there, right? Here's one more example for you all that we can kind of go through together. So in this one, I decided to put some examples inside of my lecture video to really help drive the stuff. home. I'm a big football fan. The Denver Broncos are my team. Um, so thinking back to when we were in the Super Bowl, one of which we won, pretty exciting. <laughs> Go Broncos. Anyway, let's imagine that our place kicker at the time, Brandon McManus, was trying to kick a game-winning field goal. So he's going to kick the ball and he's going to hit it so that it has... 22 meters per second as its initial velocity and that it's moving off of his foot at least initially traveling at a 40 degree angle okay based on that information alone okay i want you to tell me what is the maximum height the ball reaches off the ground and i want you to tell me what is the hang time that the ball has during the kick and then i also want you to tell me what's known as the range how far horizontally does the ball land away from the kicker we're going to assume that it starts and lands at the same height, so both level with the field. Try this one out. All right, so there's a fun trick here, okay? As you started listing your variables, hopefully you tried this one out, okay? You went down your list, you have your initial x position, you might call it zero, your initial y position, zero, time you're trying to find, so on and so forth. And then you got to your velocities. What is the initial x velocity? What is the initial y velocity? You're not actually told that, right? You're told the total velocity, the vector component, the velocity at an angle of 22 meters per second, but it didn't tell you what the x component and y component of that velocity is. So it's really important that you take your velocity and break it into x and y components. How do you do that? Using trig. Your hypotenuse here is the 22 meters per second. Your angle here is the 40 degrees. And so what you can do is you can find the x component, the adjacent side of my triangle is just the hypotenuse multiplied by the cosine of that angle. 22 cosine of 40 degrees gives you 17 meters per second. And similarly, the y velocity is, again, the hypotenuse multiplied by the sine of that angle, which comes out to be equal to 14 meters per second. So now you can go ahead and do some solving. All right. First thing you're asked to figure out is what is the maximum height? Well, when the ball is at its maximum height, its final velocity in the vertical direction is zero, right? As something's moving up, the instant it's at its very highest point, its vertical velocity must be zero. If it's more than zero, then it's going to keep going up. If it's less than zero, it's already on its way back down. So therefore, at that peak, at that one instant that it's at its max height, its velocity is zero. So we identify our variables, and we can actually solve using our third equation of motion, the one shown here. Final velocity zero, initial, we just found. We know acceleration, and we want to find the final position. Notice in here, the initial position we defined as zero, so it's not in the equation as a result. So you can solve for the position, do the math, and you find that the maximum height it reaches is 10 meters above the ground. Boom, box worthy. Moving on, we now want to find the time of flight, the hang time, as well as the range. And so we can use the y variables again. Notice here, I changed something. Now my y final position is zero. What does that mean? Well, I'm looking at, let's maybe go back here for a second. For the last part, I evaluated from the start to this point up here, which maybe I'd call point A or something like that, right? Now I'm going to look from my initial point down here, all the way to point B. Our equations of motion are true between any two points in time. So you can go from point zero to point A, from point zero to point B, from point A to point B. You could do it to some random point halfway up. You can do all of this between any two points in time. So keep that in mind, it will become quite useful as we move forward. Anyway, now I have my new variables where I'm starting and ending at the same elevation, okay? And again, final velocity here, we don't know. 
It's actually going to be negative 14 meters per second by symmetry. You can prove that, but we don't really need that information. Instead, we want to find the time. So we can use our second equation of motion once again. 0 equals 14t plus 1 half negative gravity times t squared. This is actually technically a quadratic equation, right? So there should be two solutions. If you factor out a t, one of those solutions is 0. And then the second solution, if you solve, is 2.9 seconds. Well, t equals 0, yeah, it's at an elevation of 0 when you start. That's what that's saying. But the one we care about is the hang time, which is the time at which it returns to ground level, which is 2.9 seconds later. And then lastly, to find the range, we can use our x equations of motion now that we know the time, plug it in, and we find that it's a box worthy 49 meters. I mean, my picture's in the way, so there we go. Boom. So, pretty good, huh? All right, here's one more question, which I may have kind of given hints at least to this moments ago, but this is another conceptual question. So imagine you're on the top of a cliff and you have two stones. One, you're going to throw upward at an angle, okay? So let's say you throw it up at like a 30 degree angle, all right? And then the other one, you're going to throw downward at the same angle, okay? Well, sorry, just kidding. Stone one is being thrown, oops, okay. Stone one is being thrown downward and stone two is being thrown upward. Just said those back. So they're both being thrown at with the same initial velocity and the same angle. Okay, my question to you all is, which one's going to hit the water moving faster? The one you throw up or the one you throw down? What do you think? Think about it. Pause it if you want. Talk with a friend if you have one or go find mom or your brother or your roommate or your pal or call up your girlfriend or boyfriend. I don't care. Talk to somebody. What do you think? All right. The correct answer, they will hit with the exact same velocity. Okay, because what happens is by symmetry, the one that you throw up, when it returns back to that same exact elevation, it's moving downward with the exact same velocity at the same angle. So it actually, the path from point P to the water and from the start to the water for number one and for number two, those are going to be identical. So this section right here for rock one is identical to this section here for rock two. And so the speed that they hit the water with is actually identical. Now the thing that's different, which you may have thought of when you came up with your answer, the thing that's different is the hang time, right? Rock one will, would hit the ground much sooner than rock two would because it's got to go up, slow to a stop, and then fall back down. All right, so kind of a tricky question there, but symmetry kind of gives away the answer. All right, the last question I have for you before we wrap things up. What angle, what initial angle would you want to launch a projectile at to get it to its maximal possible range, assuming again that there's no air resistance? What do you think? Well, the correct answer, as you may have guessed, is 45 degrees, the perfect combination of giving yourself height and hang time, so more vertical, a steeper angle gives you more hang time and more height, but it also causes you to sacrifice horizontal velocity. So if you launched at like a 70 degree angle, you'd get really high and have lots of hang time, but your x velocity, your horizontal velocity component would be small, so you'd be moving horizontally rather slowly and you wouldn't make it as far. If you went down at like 30 or 20 degrees, you would have a great, a very large horizontal velocity, but you wouldn't have very much hang time and wouldn't make it as far. 45 degrees is the perfect combination of those two. Again, this is assuming no air resistance. Adding air resistance makes it a bit more complicated. So that wraps up chapter three and all of our kind of kinematics description of motion. Stay tuned because soon we're gonna move on to talking about how things gain acceleration, which is via a force. So we're going to talk about Newton's laws and forces next. Get excited. All right, have a box-worthy day.